So I, I suspect none of you have heard of PetriNets. Uh, so this is a kind of a, a formalized modeling language uh, which goes back 30 or 40 years. And generally what we have in PetriNets is this idea of places, which are generally drawn as a round circle, and transitions. Now, if you remember back to our notation system, we define places as components, i.e. proteins, genes, things which are physical entities. And we defined transitions, or all our processes, were called transitions. Okay? So there's a direct mapping between what we've just drawn and this idea that there's places and transitions. So these are things called bipartite graphs. Okay? So a bipartite graph is something where you must have place, transition, place, place, transition, place. That is the structure of it. It's bipartite. Everything must alternate in the way that it works. Um, so as I say, generally a place represents an entity and transition represents terms of process. And the edges are the interactions between these things as drawn. So actually what was quite apparent, I didn't know about this until I started looking at it, that what we were almost drawing in our diagrams were petri nets, although we'd never actually formally stated them as such, because I'd never even heard of petri nets at this point in time. Now there was this paper that came out in PLOS Computational Biology in 2008, and it reported a new algorithm for running petri nets, called the Signaling Petri Net Algorithm. And it's a very nice paper. Uh, and if you want to know more, I would suggest you read about it. It'll explain something of the maths behind it and the assumptions and how this algorithm compares to other modeling approaches. And basically, it models the flow of tokens. So in all of these Petri nets here, what you're assuming is... So a token, think of a token as the amount or representing the amount or activity of a given entity. So if this has tokens, it exists. The more tokens that you have on this place, the more of it there is in reality. Okay? So a token is just a way of representing that. And what we're going to do in PetriNets is we're going to move tokens from one place to another based around the topology of the graph itself. So we're going to, f when this guy here fires, it's going to move tokens from, from one place downstream from that place. So it's going to go from a parent to a child. Again, it's a lot easier to actually see than it is to imagine, but I'm just asking you just to bear with me for this kind of slightly tricky bit here. The nice thing about this is it doesn't need kinetic parameters, and it's a very fast computation. However, the original software that supported this algorithm was, to say the least, limiting. It was difficult to install. You could only draw things as white circles and black rectangles. And so what we ended up doing is taking the algorithm, re-implementing the algorithm, and putting the algorithm within our favorite tool by a layout. Okay? So we're going to come on to this in a moment. I just want to spend one moment trying to show a little bit more about the logic behind what we do what we're doing. Just I'm not really expecting you to get this, but I just want to at least attempt to explain it. So imagine we have a Wii network of three nodes and two transitions. Yep. We have 100 tokens here. And what we're going to do is we're going to fire these transitions. Now, when we fire a transition, what happens? So we fire this T1, then these tokens are going to move from there to there. Okay? But the way that the algorithm works is that a random number of tokens are going to move across. So a random number between 0 and 100 are going to move from there to there when this fires. Okay? Now, in this Wii scenario, there is also a second possibility, is that the order in which transitions fire is also random. Okay? So T1 could fire first or T2 can fire first. Now, why this is important is because if T2 fires first, okay, so in this, this is fired, but of course, there's no tokens there, so no tokens have moved down there. Okay? If T1 fires first, then tokens can move over here, and we move, on average, 50 tokens, but it's random. Okay? On average, it will be 50, but in reality, in any given firing, it could be 0 to 100. If you fired it a million times, the approximate answer would be 50, because it would be an average of all those random firings. But in this two scenarios here, because tokens of this fi guy fired first, we only fire a, a, 
a, a transition once. So when this guy fires, there, this is already fired, so it's not going to move. So this would be the end point after firing these tr two transitions once. This is one scenario. The second scenario is that T1 fires first. On average, 50 tokens move over. T2 then fires. There are 50 tokens here, and it's going to move there. But both of these possibilities are equally likely. And actually, what you would then forget is a distribution, which is a, an, a, a summary of those two answers, OK? That we'd have 37 and 12. Okay? So that's one firing. And we repeat this process again. And again, you get a distribution of tokens through the system. Not easy to get, and but I'll show you, as I say, once we actually get into it, I think it's important just to learn this. So if we take that same scenario and we do it, so run is where we actually fire every transition once. So the smaller the numbers the runs have, the more stochastic, the more random the answer is going to be because we're a long way from the average. So if we fire these tokens here, we can see that so this is the positions downstream, uh, or this is the number of time blocks, sorry. So we have this idea of a time block. So a time block is where we fire all the transitions uh, once, and then we set it up again and do it all over again. So in runs, we do, uh, so these are the number of runs. So what we can basically see is the more times we do a run, so the more time we actually go through this whole network and fire the transitions once and then go in the next again, we take the average answer, and so the more times we do it, the more it approximates the average answer that we see. Now, the other thing is, is that this is rule-based, okay? And so we've just, up to now, considered a linear run of, of, of transitions and places. But where, what happens when we get things coming into a transition? So imagine we had A and B binding. Imagine that scenario here. This represents A, this represents B. Now, if we don't have any of B, we're not going to get AB. And this is how the tokens work. So that in this case here, there are no tokens on B, and so we cannot end up with the product because there are no tokens here. In this scenario, where we have both the same amount of A and B, then we don't end up with 200 tokens here. We end up with 100 tokens. And that's kind of what you'd expect. So if you had 100 A, 100 B, you're going to end up with 100 of AB, not 200 AB. And if you only have 10 of B, then you only end up with 10 AB. So it's kind of how you'd expect a system to work in terms of binding and the amounts. And so how you move transitions, f uh, tokens from a transition, in this case, if 100 tokens come here, we will distribute tokens to the same amount downstream. However, you distribute tokens from a place, you will end up with only half that amount. Very simple rules, but simple rules that map quite nicely onto the concepts of biological interactions. Okay. 